So let me introduce my guest, which is 16 year veteran of Bridgewater, um, author of Raising a Thief, which we're going to talk a lot about today and the forthcoming book, Hero of Our Time. He is a podcaster. He is an investor. He is a father, a husband, and a great friend and mentor, and um, certainly a very important one of mine. So, Paul, we welcome you back, and thanks so much for being here today. Thank you uh, for having me, and uh, it's good to see so many uh, familiar faces and dear friends who I've missed. Well, um, Paul, so much of what we want to talk about today is going to be about Raising a Thief, the book you wrote and left Bridgewater um, about a year ago when it, when it first published. Um, but first, for those who don't know you personally, or maybe only know the legends of, you know, the person who ran the scrum uh, the day of his interviews, could you tell us a little bit about your your Bridgewater story, how you came to us, and um, what you did while you were here at Bridgewater? Sure. So I came to Bridgewater it was uh, much smaller then, uh, in uh, the summer of 2004. And I remember I... Uh, I did interview on the day of the first scrum. That is a true story. There's numerous anecdotes about that story, but basically I think a guy named Parag had started it. I gotten through my three CIO interviews of which Greg, I saw the call was uh, one of them. And I remember it was like philosophical guy. That was Ray. Uh, like nice guy. That was Bob. And then it was like verbal Kung Fu. That was Greg. And we spent like I don't know, some time, it felt like a long period of time, Greg tried to knock me off my position and I just didn't know where he was going. I just tried to keep saying the same thing. Somehow got through. Then we had, uh, the second half of the interview was going to be Jim Haskell and others, but they interviewed me to do the uh, scrub. So that was the whole um, scrub story. At the time, Bridgewater was not famous. Ray was not famous. This is pre-2008. This is pre that it's an established brand. And I remember I asked my friends at Wall Street, I'd been working on a trading floor. Have you guys heard of Ray? And they were like, I don't know if Ray's on the call. They were like, he's really weird, but he writes great research reports around bonds. That was the reputation circa 2004. Uh, and then I came there and uh, I worked for about a month on bond flows with Bob in research. And then Ray put the kibosh on that, turned me into a portfolio strategist. Uh, then I got involved with the China stuff and did research uh, stuff uh, on China. And that was sort of the, the expanse of my time, mostly client service, probably maybe one third research, a lot of China, a little bit of Russia too. So let's turn to raising a thief. You wrote the book while you were at Bridgewater. I know because I was lucky enough to read various drafts of it because of my job. Um, but tell us, for those who haven't read it, why, why were you writing that book? What was it about and why did you write it? It's basically about being a parent to a really challenging kid. And uh, a lot of parents have had that experience. I know a number of people on the call uh, who have talked to me since I wrote it have, have also wrestled with that. So I think that's a pretty universal um, concept. Uh, the particular sort of uh, insight at the center of the book is something called attachment. Our daughter was treated terribly before she was adopted. And it turns out, while we didn't know it at the time, but there's tons of uh, research since then that if you interrupt an infant's relationship to its primary caregiver, it has massive um, long-term consequences that are deleterious and actually very difficult to solve. So there's, and of course this is gonna happen in degrees, the severity, the disruption, what it happens, et cetera. So it's about being a parent, it's about attachment. And I would say it's also a little bit about fatherhood. I have this notion that basically we're in fatherhood 3.0. Fatherhood 1.0 was basically people like my grandfather, and the job was put food on the table. Fatherhood 2.0 was my dad, which was put food on the table and get the kids an education. And fatherhood 3.0, which is I think where I am and probably a lot of the dads that are in the room, is not only are you supposed to put food on the table, or at least help, and get your kids educated, you're also supposed to be emotionally attuned to everybody in the family. Much easier said than done, and I think that we're one of the first, I, I think we are the first generation of fathers who have this expectation. What I found is that 
in a family, particularly with a very stressful situation, in this case, a child, being basically the father you aspire to be is, at least for me, it was much harder than I had thought it was going to be. And so a chunk of the book that I think a number of people have related to is what that experience is like, what it means to be off your game as a dad, and the subtle ways that your behavior can have a negative impact on the family and how you learn to do better. What was it like... Um... Li living th not I'm, I'm going to get to the creative process in a second but um living through that that we all read about while you were working here at Bridgewater so I mean I when I would read that I would picture you you know grading my mocks so you know between those things you were you were grading my mocks and so for those of us who are carrying these burdens that our colleagues don't know about talk about what that was like it was tough and I think a lot of people have that balance that they're wrestling through and uh, Bridgewater was certainly very supportive with this. In other words, when I said I needed to go out to New Mexico or other, you know, to a treatment center where my daughter was or take time off unexpectedly, et cetera, they were very positive for that. On the other hand, I think you all know Bridgewater is not an easy place to work. And on a day when I goofed something up at work and there were plenty of people willing to point that out, and then I'd also goof something up at home, but I wasn't necessarily going to share that while well, I was up all night and that contributed to me goofing up this thing at work, you can get caught in a self-reinforcing situation that isn't good for your family. It isn't good for Bridgewater. That happens. So it's, it's just a very um, tough thing. And I think that one thing that I learned from um, the book, and I think is, is, is a very worthwhile thing for everybody on the call bearing in mind is when you're talking with somebody, it's very difficult to appreciate what the full scale of things that they're dealing with at work. And so on my best days, when somebody would respond sharply to me or in, in a way that I felt was kind of off, I would think a little bit, this might not have anything to do with me. This might have to do with something else that's going on in that person's life. How can I find a way to apprehend that with that person and kind of unpack that? Because that's literally how you make sort of yourself better and them better as well. So it was, it was uh, uh, a challenging situation. I think that the book came out involuntarily. I literally began writing it on airplanes the complete wrong way. The way you're supposed to write a book is, here's an idea, you talk to an agent, you write a book proposal, then you have an outline, you follow the outline, then you revise it, the book is done. Like if you were gonna write something about whatever topic, uh, how best to invest. That's how you do it. This thing I did completely wrong, which is on these flights to distant places, as again, as many people on the call know, you got a lot of time there. And I just got burnt out doing other things. And I just began writing from the book, literally from the inside out, totally backwards. And then I began getting these fragments and showing them to people and they responded. And I said, well, maybe there's something here. And then I began sort of evolving it and editing it towards a book. But memoir cannot be, it's a strange thing because it is a, it is a book form that is obviously something that you yourself participated in, but memoir can never be a memoir. It literally can't be about you. It needs to be something that you're close to, but for other people to relate to it, nobody really cares about my life. My life's not that interesting. You need to make it bigger than you. And so that is, for me, it was a real creative process of editing and editing and editing. And you really did here make it, you made something that really resonated with people. You're getting letters from all over the world. Of, of course, many of us at Bridgewater read it and there's Bridgewater book clubs and um, uh, local book clubs and friends we've shared it with, but you're getting letters from all over the world that you've written something that really speaks to people. What do you think it is about this story? Um, I, I, uh, I think that people can sense that it's authentic. I think that's, that's the big thing is that there's flaws in the story, there's things I could have done better, but people are reading it and I think that they see something um, universal in it, which is our desire to uh, leave things in a better place. I think that's part of what being parents is about. It's part of what running a company is about. And that notwithstanding that desire, sometimes you can be confronted by things that are unbelievably challenging, that are bigger than you. 
and there isn't necessarily a happy ending. Americans in particular love happy endings. Like I've literally at dinner parties, they're like, oh, you wrote a book? And I'm like, yeah, it's about being a dad. And I've literally gotten this, they go, does it have a happy ending? And I go, no. And they're like, ooh. And the other thing is they say, I sometimes say, so I wrote my first book and they're like, oh, what's the book called? And I go, Raising a Thief. And they say, Raising a Thief in a single sentence. And they're like, oh. So I think that that's the thing that scares people about the theme a little bit, but it's also what attracts them to it, is it's sort of getting beneath the surface to something that I think is, um, in many people's life, uh, a common theme. That scary, dark, disruptive part that they don't necessarily have a solution for. And in this case, you know, we didn't have a solution for. That's right. And, and what resonated so much for me was the way you talk about trauma. Mm. an interruption. Can you talk about that as a concept and, and what that means for, for people? Yeah. I think that there are disruptions that happen uh, to people and um, that they can turn your life upside down. And I do believe that people who have had them versus people that haven't are fundamentally uh, different. There's one, one strategist who I coached whose name, name I won't use unless he volunteers it, but he's just normal. He comes from a totally healthy family. His wife's family is healthy. His parents are healthy. Like you go back chains of generations and it's like healthy, 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 healthy. <laughs> and he's just such a normal guy. And I'm like, thank goodness you exist. I'm so happy you exist. And you know what? I bet his kids are going to be fantastic too. And it goes through generations. But there's other people who have significant disruptions. And the, those disruptions change you. And I think that you become a different person. And they're all manner of disruptions. Your country can collapse. I've had so many people on my podcast. I have two people whose country collapses. This happens to people. I have people whose parents have killed themselves. I have people who've had drug addiction. You know, there's my daughter's story. These inter interruptions come in many, many different forms. The key thing in terms of their seriousness, the impact of people, what I learned in the research about my daughter is the severity matters and critically, the timing matters. I had thought that if something happened, my daughter was not fed before we uh, adopted her, she was starved. And then she was placed in three different homes. And I had thought, well, she's physically healthy. She's got a normal IQ. This thing happened so long ago, she won't remember it. We're the perfect family to take her in and make all this right. Wrong that what the research shows, particularly by this pioneering psychiatrist, Bowlby, who I write a lot about in the book, and he began studying this very interesting question, why do children steal? At the time he was studying this in the 30s, people were in the thrall of Freud, and they believed that children stole because they had repressed sexual desire. Mm -hmm. And Bowlby was like, well, let's take case histories from the children instead. And what he found was disruption from the primary caregiver was the fundamental thing that ruptured that connection and was the marker of the change uh, in behavior. And what I found with um, this trauma is the more significant and sort of life-threatening it is, and the earlier it is, the harder it is to recover from. And so this actually has implications for what public policy you would pursue. So the thing, if I think of all public policy, the thing that has the huge bang for the buck for me is anything that is reducing the likelihood of a severing of a connection of a child to its caretaker very early in life. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I've studied it before. The amount that the U.S. spends as a percentage of GDP on early childhood intervention is minuscule. It's like in the tens of billions of dollars. And to me, it's like the most obvious thing if you want to improve outcomes because if you read the story and you study my daughter, you know, she goes on as an adult to commit a felony. So notwithstanding the fact that we invested an enormous amount of energy, it wasn't enough. She probably ended up better than she would have otherwise, but it wasn't enough to deal with that uh, early disruption. The last thing I'll say is, yes, I talk about my, myself and my wife there. My wife was kidnapped as a daughter. Right. Kidnapped right. in Pakistan. And you would think, well, that ought to mess somebody up. And of course, it does have consequences. She has insomnia and other things. But because her first seven years were safe, that provided an insulation and a foundation with which she was much more capable of dealing with what came next. Tell us about when Sonia read the book. <laughs> yeah, so I, 
retired from Bridgewater. I hadn't heard from her uh, for a while. Uh, she's an adult at that point. And, but I had posted on social media uh, about the book. And 48 hours after I left Bridgewater, she reached out to me on a Facebook Messenger chat. I hadn't heard from her for two years. And she said, I heard about the book, congratulations. And I said, listen, do you want to read it? Everybody else who I've written about, it's literally about you. Why don't you read it? So she agreed to read it. And um, she said that she uh, actually, the first episode of the podcast, Things I Didn't uh, Learn in School, is actually a talk with her. You can hear it. It's on right. Apple and Spotify. The reason I put it up there was at these book talks I was giving, people kept saying, what does your daughter think? What does your daughter think? And I was like, she actually likes it. And I think that people didn't believe me. So I finally said, listen, let's get on the phone. I'm just going to talk to you. <laughs> just say this out loud, we'll record it and post it. And people have downloaded it many, many times. Um, and what she said was it was the first time that she felt like she understood our perspective as parents. And I think that, listen, we're all inundated with media. I remember working at Bridgewater and just the volume of information. It's a very information rich environment, which is great, but there's a cost for that that it doesn't necessarily allow as much sort of deep thinking. The book is a form of deep thinking. Like if you sit down and read the, a book, any book, you are really isolating yourself off from that and you're focused on it. And I think that the act of the book forced her to see things from a different perspective. And I think that the, with readers as well, there's no way I could explain to you in a five minute conversation what it was like raising my daughter and my struggles to be a dad. It's just impossible. But a book, even though it's a very old form of media, is actually the only way I know to really bring somebody into that world successfully. And again, based on the reader feedback, uh, it has been successful in sort of bridging that gap. And so even though it was, it was very difficult for me to create, I feel like it was uh, a gift in the end to be able to communicate right. that. Can we talk about the process of writing? and creativity. Um, and, um, also, you know, what you think, if, if anything, Bridgewater, um, you know, we talked a little in the, in the prep for this, it, you know, if Bridgewater contributed to your process or detracted from your process. And can you speak a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I think that it's, it's a huge topic and I know there's a lot, I can't see everybody on the video, but I know Michael Terry is like, I've talked to them about it, about coming up with things. I think the creative process is really um, uh, key and uh, it takes practice like anything else. It's almost like practicing a sport. I'd say it's the biggest thing I've practiced since leading Bridgewater is how to actually set up your life so you can tap your creativity. So there's many different elements to it. So it has that structure. For me, like I said, I was doing this at, uh, while I was working at Bridgewater. So early, you know, early in the morning, all weekends, I would literally take vacation days from work. And I would say to my wife, I'm going to drive two hours from here. And I'm going to sit in a motel. And I'm just going to be writing this thing. And then I <laughs> she's like, Okay, and then I come back home. That's what it took. And writing in particular, most people's first draft sucks. And most people's third, fourth and fifth drafts suck. That is the reality of creating something that is great. I, we talked about this before, but I'll say it for the broader audience. Tolstoy is a genius, okay? He rewrote War and Peace seven times. Seven. It's 500,000 words. Imagine doing that. That is what it's, and, and War and Peace still, by the way, has flaws. And probably if it was edited on a word processor, they would have made it a little bit tighter. But it is a brilliant book. People come back to it again and again. That's what it takes to um, create something like that. I think the trick is when you're doing it, what I would do is basically write it, show it to people and sort of gauge a little bit like a Rorschach test. I would show little sections. And sometimes what people don't say is more important than what they do say. So if you say, give something to somebody, you're like, what do you think? And they're like, it's good. That's dangerous. That's a very dangerous sign because most people want to be polite. At Bridgewater, they'd say, well, it has X, Y, Z. Most people, they say that's good. It's like very, very neutral. You got to dig more. So I'd be constantly trying to read the, listen to these things and really finding people who can see a work that is 80% done, but is still mediocre. Like imagine reading the fifth draft of War and Peace. Finding the people that can read the fifth draft and saying, Leo, 
this thing is going to be a bomb. It's going to be <laughs> awesome, but we got to make these changes. That is exceptionally rare because most people are very good at seeing what's there. They're not good at seeing what could be there. And that was the thing that I really struggled with on this to find that. Um, and on the second book I'm writing right now, I'm dealing with this, the same thing. It's, it's every single book is friggin' tough. It's very, very hard to create something that's good at Bridgewater. I think the trick is that so much of what's been created at Bridgewater is already uh, quite good, that bringing something that's new to that, that is 70% done, that people are like, I can see the 30% this needs. It is, a, in my experience, it was a tough environment for that. Because if you're looking at anything that's not all the way done, it's going to suck by definition. So how do you create an environment where you're literally not, you're, you're, you're stopping truly terrible stuff from going, but you're really encouraging experimentation the other way? I think any creative project, I know I'm being long-winded, but any creative project, one novelist described it as like driving a car in fog. That's what it's like. You can see like 20 feet ahead of you. You can't see the damn thing done. And you have to be living in that and really excited about that when being in fog is tiring. So tell, are you in the fog in the current book? Or yeah. the, the, the book you're writing now, tell us, tell us Deeply. about, Draft tell us what four. it's about, tell us what it's about and what so to expect. The, the basic idea I had was, A, I wanted to write something fiction as opposed to nonfiction. Fiction, nonfiction, you actually have to tell the truth. So the idea that you could actually get paid to lie was like, an, that's what fiction is. You're making up stuff the entire, it was like a very, very liberating idea for me to try to do, but very, very hard because you have to do things like invent dialogue. You have to invent characters, which is stuff that I'd always aspired to do, but okay, so now sit down and actually do it and make it as good as other people's um, books. The book is, my notion was the world that we live in is one that is a mystery to lots of people. They don't understand how international affairs works. Markets are an absolute mystery to them. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I wanted to create a story that brought people in a little bit the way John Grisham could bring you into legal stuff. I wanted to bring somebody into this. So I created a story that's basically a murder mystery. And the weird thing about the story is everything I've come up with in the story, after I would invent it, I would be like, well, I wonder if that's ever happened. And I've got a corrupt treasury secretary. Sorry, Dave, if you're on. I've got uh, the Russian secret police murdering government officials. I've got the head of the Chinese secret police running like a massive money laundering plot. And then I would Google these things and they all had actually happened. They'd happened at different points in time, but they actually happened. The guy who came up with Bretton Woods, this is true, was a Soviet spy. He was actually given gifts by the Soviet government, the, whatever, Dex, Harry Dexter White, the guy who crushed Keynes to put up the dollar in the reserve system. He was a Soviet sympathizer who they had come. So I was like, interesting concept. We'll ramp that right up to the present. <laughs> so I basically uh, uh, took these things and created that. And I think it's going to be a good story. I hope you guys will all read it. I think it's very close to being finished, but it's in that thing now where it's like every seed has to pop. And if it doesn't pop, I don't want to publish it. Okay. Look forward to it. Now you're writing all kinds of other things too. Yes. One of my favorite weekly newsletters I get is your Substack. You're you're interviewing people on your podcast. Things I didn't learn in school, like you like you already mentioned. Tell us about that and um, what you're focusing on there, and um, so how it's different than the Substack started as a mistake, basically. Which was I was like, okay, now that I'm gone from Bridgewater, I've saved some money. I can't screw this up. So I better write down what I'm thinking about markets because that's what I did at Bridgewater. Initially, I started dealing with news. I dealt with Bloomberg. I dealt with South China Morning Post. And what they really want is they want an opinion. They want you to say, Biden bad, um, Europe good, antitrust good. It's like everything has to be an opinion. And I was like, well, I don't think that's the way it works. I actually want to write about what I think people are wrestling with. So I started trying the Substack concept, which is basically when I'm thinking about markets that week, literally what's popping into my head. And it's, you know, based on conversations I'm having, et cetera. 
And um, I uh, started uh, writing that and putting it out and collaborating with some other people at Rose, et cetera, which are ex-Bridgewater people. And um, I think that that can turn into a book too, a nonfiction book, which would basically be like, how do you make sense out of money? Like everybody yes. worries about money. So how do you put that into plain English so that people can um, understand it? So that's, that's, that's what I've been up to. Then it's interesting to see what that reaction is like if you're writing for, you know, Bridgewater and you've got Karen and Jason and all these other people, that's one audience. And then what I found is the initial op-eds I wrote, when I talked to anybody who was a non-specialist, they had no idea what I was talking about. Like I would show them to, you know, a trader type, they'd be like, this is great. But if you mm -hmm. showed it to somebody else, they're like, I have no idea what the heck you're talking about. So I started trying to learn how to write about it in a style that a general audience could respond to. And that's what I'm trying to sort through. That's Ray right, Jason. Jason <laughs> talking to geeks. That's right. And so, like, mm -hmm. I love reading those things. The, um, uh, but it's it, uh, it's sort of tried to evolve that to a slightly broader, um, it was, <laughs> to a slightly broader uh, conversation. And you know, I appreciate your guys' feedback on that. So, to the extent you read it and you think that I'm way off base, please write me and let me know, and and, I, and I'll learn from that. That's right. And, and Michael Terry references a letter to a young person. Any actual young people or like me um, still needs letters to young people. Uh, that's a really good one to read. And I send it to my whole family. And um, I think it, you know, it's the kind of thing that resonates because of how you hit the approachability and relevance um, to people. So it's great. Yeah, now, I think that people are so, anyways, they're baffled by our world. Well, a good a good thing is like I've always loved to hear your take on things either you know the reading the way you read a situation or the way you you know look at look at current events and that's why like having access to this the sub stack is is wonderful but you know while we're all together why don't you you know tell us what you see in the world today you know if uh, you know how's the world changing and what is the what are your what are your observations more more broadly about what's going on in the world so I think that I think the biggest thing, I mean, I agree with a lot of the stuff that, uh, you know, people are very kind uh, to allow me to continue to read the daily observations, which I read and dutifully grade. I don't know whether anybody reads the grades, but I'm trying to stick with it, baby. Mm -hmm. The um, the biggest thing that I see that's different from my view uh, outside of Bridgewater is how truly disruptive the technology is that we're going through. I mean, I literally think about it as... Um, I, has sort of as I was sketching out this uh, this piece today, I think about it as like locusts that are descending on industry after industry, and the same way locusts descend on crops and eat everything and nothing's left. That's the way this technology uh, is working, and uh, you know, I have more time to talk to other hedge funds and see how they are run and see how they are investing and what topics they're interested in, and then just literally observing it with being in the storytelling industry. So uh, I, I, I think that that is, um, I think that is a very disruptive uh, force that is, um, was harder for me to see at Bridgewater because it's so solid. Um, to give you uh, examples of that, like if you look at, um, uh, for instance, <laughs> he's, he, Bing says he looks at the wire grants. That's, he said, I can't speak that much, but I'm waiting. I would imagine if history is predictive with, with a discount. But the, um, <laughs> for instance, if you look at um, uh, inflation, which is a topic I know Bridgewater's been writing about, the big areas where there's been inflation over periods of time has been in medical costs and also in education. I believe that as a result of this pandemic, the locusts are going to begin to descend on those industries. And when they do, there's going to be a huge change. Like you think about education, it is crazy that education costs should be rising and rising and rising, but it's a perfect thing for an economy of scale. You know what? Engine 101, you need one class. Khan Academy basically gives you the class for frigging free. So basically you need a certificate. So what you've begun to see is the sub-educational places beginning to do this. Georgia Tech, for instance, has something that you can read the press about it. They've been changing this. And they're all of a sudden, they're like, listen, let's offer engineering online. And then he goes, you know what? Education costs can plummet. 
And so that is an example of this disruption that that I think can begin to happen. Medical costs, you know, why are medical costs higher? You guys had Nick Rebert, uh, uh, you know, do he gets into that more. So basically, these changes are going to, I think, begin to happen. And the technology thing, as a person that's trying to create content, are just crazy disruptive to witness firsthand. I needed to create a logo. I contacted a designer in New York. Cost? $2,000. Then I went to the global marketplace, which you could do through a number of different websites. I found a designer in Serbia. Cost? Two zero dollars Twenty. 2000 verse 20. And you know what? The logo is pretty damn good. Maybe it's not perfect, nice. but it works for, It works relatively okay. And if I want her to create yeah. something for Twitter, I send her a little note, boom, it comes. So basically seeing that technological disruption up close, it's way more, um, it's, a, it's a long answer. It's, 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 it's moving faster. It is more disorienting than I had believed before. But that. what, but what do you mean up? You mean up close because you're interacting with it versus Correct. studying, Correct. studying it from in you're the You're using the world. these tools daily and right. seeing how they work, you know, selling a book, selling a book. I used to love these community bookstores. Fantastic. The books smell nice. There's coffee there. There's dogs walking around. There's people at bell bottoms. You know what? Amazon is just eviscerating them. It's a huge locust. And if you want to sell a book, you get enough ratings and you buy Amazon advertising and the book just continues to go out. And you don't do anything. So it's it's seeing it firsthand as opposed to reading a great thick research packet about it, which was awesome, but it's very different. And experiencing what social media is like. Like who really reads newspapers seriously anymore? These things used to be the, the absolute... Um, uh, <laughs> mm. the, uh, these things used to be the absolute arbiter, but people get their information very differently. That changes the way people perceive reality, which changes politics. It's all that. So that's relative to the big stuff Bridgewater talks. I would say that's the biggest marginal oh, right. shift that I've seen. Right. And then um, that also was your reference that an Amazon, Amazon verified review by the people that um, at Bridgewater who read the book should put it in, right? Yes. Yes. Um, that stuff makes a big difference. Um, it right. goes there and then and it feeds their algorithms, which then feeds their placement, which then feeds the rag keg and it's kind of self-reinforcing. Right. Well, I'm going to turn it. I know so many people here are excited to talk to you and ask you questions. So those of you who are ready to, um, uh, you know, put it in the chat, I'm going to ask one more question, um, about Bridgewater. You know, what, what do you, I ask this of every alumni who we talk to, um, what do you miss most and what is your advice to us? So why don't we start with, you know, what do you miss most about being at Bridgewater? Um, I miss you people, uh, genuinely. Like there are good people there. And one of the things you see when you're outside in the hurly burly of the world is that Bridgewater people have been very filtered. You needed to pass through many hoops before you got onto the side of the Zoom channel you're on right now. And you know what? It makes a difference. The per pound quality of the people um, who are there are um, extraordinary. Listen, I'm fascinated in global markets and um, and the clients who we were a part of, like I enjoyed those people. I like them. A number of them read the Substack and write back to me, et cetera. So that whole mission, um, I, I uh, miss very, very much. Being a writer is more about having time for deep thought. So literally day after day, having four, five hours where you sit and try to perfect something and understand, you use your brain differently. At Bridgewater, by the end of it, I was frequently scheduled at 30 minute intervals for huge chunks of the day. And you know, when would you try and slam in a little bit of deep thinking? There's probably people that are more capable than I was at doing that, but I struggled with having time for deep thought. Um, and I've also enjoyed uh, having the buck stop with me and I've made tons of mistakes, but having that sense of um, that, it, that it's on me. Uh, and you know, if I'm going to send out the darn Substack thing that has a factual error, that God forbid, that then relates to my advice to Bridgewater. I think that Bridgewater, you know, your strength is these filtered people, these ways of doing things, this unbelievable brand. It's like that type of thing to be able to cultivate that sense of like scrappy entrepreneurialism. Because without it, I think that the company is is at risk of the locusts that I was talking about before descending on it. I don't know what the locusts are going to be, but that's just the natural course of companies. I wrote a piece called All Companies Die. Yeah. Um, that happens. 
and any existing company, it's a risk. And so I think the strength of Bridgewater is simultaneously its weakness. And I think making time for deep thought, trying to figure out some sort of thing where you can really test in a pure sense what people's scrappiness are, those would be the things that I, I think, um, you know, my vision is dated. It was a year ago. But those are the ingredients that I might seek to inject in the culture to keep it healthy. Thank you. Um, and, a, you know, a year, a year is short and long and what a weird year it's been. Yes. Um, but I, you know, appreciate the perspective. Um, Brian Lawler, I want to go to you first, if you want to come off mute and ask Paul your question. Paul, it's so good to see you. Hey, man. Miss you. miss you very much. Uh, I loved the book. I, it was just, I was imagining as I was reading it, like all of our trips around the world together and you going through that at the same time. And some of it I knew and some of it I didn't, but I uh, interested in sort of how, how, how did Sasha respond to the book? Did, did he have a greater appreciation? Was he sort of already really clued in on that? Did it, did it sort of evolve his thinking just in terms of how he thought about growing up in that situation? He, uh, he liked the book. It didn't have a strong effect on him or uh, as, as it did on uh, my daughter. Um, he, the interesting, the strange thing is, this is very strange, is his peer group is really into the book. Hmm. So a lot of his peers have gotten interested in the book. And I think they've gotten interested in the book because... Um, uh, and, and then they started to, you know, some of them emailed in questions. Some of the sub stacks was stuff that I wrote in response to them because they were asking questions. I think the thing was that they related to was how challenging it can be to have the family you aspire to. These are kids who are in their late 20s, but how much that desire doesn't go away. And so that's sort of been more that they, it, it's sort of like a topic of a conversation among his, 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 his peer group. So that's, that's sort of what, I, what I've seen from him. And he never came in for the brunt of the targeting from his sister. And so they have an okay relationship, not really close, but okay relationship. Um, so his, his, you know, his reaction hasn't been as strong. Marina's too. She was like, great book. She heads it to clients and so forth, but she's like, great book, but she's like, whatever. <laughs> Been there, done that. What other questions? Joel Thompson, if you want to come off mute and ask yours. Thank you. Um, so Paul, can you reflect a little bit on sort of what you think the implication should be on our criminal justice system uh, for people who had suffered this interrupted attachment as a young child and where that you know, probably is a contributing factor to um, future criminal behavior as they grow up in life. Should we treat them differently? How should how should we handle that as a in, in a more just society? Uh, it's something. I, thanks for the question. It's something I've thought about a lot. Um, and and as I mentioned, it we've literally bumped up on this because I came up with a title for the book before this actually happened. But my daughter did commit a felony and and was prosecuted. My basic thought is. Uh, you have to put your energy in prevention. Like if you have studied uh, Jeffrey Canada's, I think he was a speaker at Bridgewater, the Harlem Children's Project. The way he has tried to deal with things there to improve the success rate of kids is being um, the minute that a woman gets pregnant, he's already having teams go out to their house, work with them in prenatal care and work from very early on. I would take the type of program that Jeffrey Canada is doing and literally do it nationally. That is the investment that I would do, massive. So that, you know, uh, my daughter's mother, she was, my daughter was alone in a communal apartment in Russia, screaming because of hunger. That is, that is where it happens. And it's only because she was in a communal apartment that other people heard her. A communal apartment is shared kitchen, shared toilet, individual rooms that people are living in. Whether the birth mom had mental illness, alcohol problem, I don't know. We've tried to do our research. And if you read the book, you can see we can never quite ascertain. But that is, listen, some kids are going to be born to parents with mental illness or drug addiction. You need to get in there and try to help them. Once they're an adult, though, I do believe, and this can sound harsh, but I think it's true and it's really been the best treatment for my uh, daughter is you're responsible for your behavior. And um, that natural consequences that she's had would be one of the best things for her. In other words, we kept telling her, listen, and not only us, teachers, 
if you continue to act this way, it's going to lead to real world consequences. And I think she thought that we were all making stuff up. And then she stole somebody's credit card and the state she was in, like, you know, you're here by charge. You know, we're considering prison terms, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, this is for real. And then it began to impact her employment. So I think consequences are very important and it's tragic. I'm sure that I've actually studied it some. There are many people in the prison justice system exactly because of this. And something I focused on my podcast is basically bad luck. Bad luck happens to people. It's awful. And it can have a determinate effect on what happens next. I spoke with one guy, uh, Roger Johnson, the podcast, this African-American guy who grew up in just the craziest circumstances who's also served time. So my thought is spend your money aggressively early on and just realize that once a child is an adult, once a person is an adult with this, there's a much more limited set of things you can do and there isn't necessarily a good solution. Um, one of the, the, one of the parts that hit me the hardest was despite all the, the, the very sad things that happened was when um, maybe she had come home at one point and was like a late teenager and you could see the difference between the other kids and her because she yeah, didn't have anything split. to say she yes. didn't have anything to say she didn't yes. so it's one thing when you're 11 and 12 and that's a thing but you know you saw them like you said the split and um and how you dealt with that you could actually see it with little babies it's fascinating mm -hmm. if you watch you will see a little baby that is securely attached you'll see the parent with them at the playground the kid will walk like five feet you know unsteadily off then they turn and they look at the parent and the parent clues into them connection made and the kid is like okay safe to go off and explore reading films travel it all comes from that first step so that's where you need to mm -hmm. um, set it up karen you're asking well what do you do to uh read and learn about the world now that you're not at bridgewater i try to set up a discipline basically so um the the morning is all about uh fiction so it is writing the book and i also you have to do a ton of research for that and that involves uh, uh, making lists of research materials I need for the book and also authors I need to read to be familiar with the genre. Then the afternoon, I'm doing more investing um, Substack stuff. I am a, a member of a number of different groups that I've gotten membership to that have regular structured conversations with different material. I can give you the names of them that, you know, you, you, I'm sure they welcome you as well, that I participate in, that I have homework in. Um, and then the Substack forces me to do research around different topics, and that'll lead me to conversations. That thing that I was saying before about inflation that didn't come randomly, it was a question mm -hmm. I had. So then I began to research the different components to understand it. So it's a combination of having a structured day, being members of groups, um, and then also I do, I'm a huge believer in networking. So every single day I try to structure like one conversation with somebody, not too much because you don't have time to write, but one conversation with somebody. Um, I still speak to people in China, you know, I have evening calls, we sit up and I ask them different things. So I believe in that networking a lot. And the Substack is helpful for that as well. I say, here's what I'm thinking about the world. Why don't you tell me what you're thinking? Jim, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Paul, um, one of the things I found fascinating was how you came to the decision to make a big change and then make it pretty, you know, quickly. And the advice that you've given me and others, I think, in terms of making big changes, maybe you could share that with the broader audience, because I think it's a great way of thinking, particularly as you work your way back from your actuarial table. <laughs> yeah, I think that it's, it's, um, uh, I've made a couple of these big switches in my life. Um, and I think though the thing that it, if you read the book that uh, uh, you got a taste of is I had two parents who both uh, uh, had short lives. And that taught me very odd that unexpected things can happen. And so you need to um, live with that decision. And so I tried to think throughout about the experiences that would be um, maximize that time, even if that was very uncomfortable. So for instance, when I graduated college, moving to Russia was crazy disruptive and hard, a little bit like what I've been going through the last year, but my learning just exploded over that period of time. 
And I, I thought that that would give me uh, a, a deeper understanding that if I did, you know, uh, and I think that probably people can have great jobs, but consulting jobs, you know, in Boston, I was never a consultant. I probably would have learned a ton, but I felt like I'd learned more um, doing that. And so, you know, I recently wrote a post about this, uh, a letter to an old person, which is just calculating how long you're likely to be alive and thinking about how you want those months to be filled. And my feeling was that the, 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 my experience with all of you was amazing and I, I treasure it. Um, I w began to feel, um, you know, that beyond financial markets, there were other things that I wanted to um, deeply explore. To get there, Jim, I, I think that you really have to listen to yourself. And if you're having trouble listening to yourself, you actually have to make a practice out of it. One of the things that I started to do that was a recommendation uh, that I, there's a, there's a book that could be helpful to you somewhere back here. Uh, it's called, uh, this sounds a goofy new age title, but trust me, it's a useful book. It's called The Artist's Way. And it's basically about accessing that creative part of you. The Artist's Way is not like you quit your Bridgewater thing and you do naked performance art. It's more like you consider how you would like to have more art in your life. It could be that you would like to study ballroom dancing once a month and that this would be a, 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 this would be the appropriate shift for you. But one of the things they suggest in that book, which I found very useful was get up first thing in the morning when your dream state is still relatively fresh, open a book by hand with a pencil, not typing, no computers, no phone, no checking your Bridgewater issue logs, just write. Just write like three pages and put it away. Don't read it, don't show it to anybody, just write and put it away and keep doing it day after day. And I think what'll happen over time is you can access whatever that thing is underneath you that may be burning. It may not be burning. You may be like, you know what, after this, this thing that I'm doing right now is totally appropriate. But what happened to me is I began doing that thing and it was just like, and again, it's new age, it was like a vibration, like a change, it's like something that needed to shift. And it was the day that I told uh, Nier, and I remember all the conversations, the email that I was going to leave Bridgewater. It was like a crazy difficult period of time for me to actually make that decision because it wasn't like leaving you guys, you know, it was, it mattered to me, but I felt like this other thing mattered more relative to the 450 months that I felt like I had left on earth. Um, I know we're coming up on time, but I'm going to go to Caitlin, then Tyler, and then Michael Terry, if we still have time to finish us off, if, uh, if we can. So Caitlin, please go. Paul, thanks for all of this being here. I really love the book. Oh, um, thanks. My question is sort of about when you're in that fog that you described, you're on the third draft yes. in the middle of it. And on one hand, just sort of like the deep humility required to open it up to others and say, tell me the 30% I'm missing to hear the criticism and even to self-assess for yourself, like this, this isn't good enough, it isn't good. But then on the other, keeping your North Star of like, I'm writing more in peace or at least I'm yeah. writing something great. And how do you get knocked enough off your path to make it better, but not so knocked off that it takes you away from that North Star, which is sort of the whole reason you're doing it and just any advice you have on navigating it. Um. Yeah, so the I'd say it, it's very difficult, as you say. The first thing is, is ego is good. Like at Bridgewater, there's a little bit of thing like, you're so egotistical, you're arrogant. Yes, to do something like this, you need to be arrogant because it's like those things, you know, those things that you punch, the weeble wobbles, and they bounce mm -hmm. back up. Like you're gonna get your face punched in. And it's ego and that type of thing that allows it to pop back up. Some healthy ego and arrogance is good because it's crazy to try these things in the first place. I mean, it is. Like, there's no shortage of good books out there. There's lots of good books. Nobody's waking up and saying, God, Paul needs to write another book. Zero. On the other hand, then you've really got to seek out those people who have that eye. And I would say really, really, really deeply listen to them. Like this most recent thing, I had some, this book, I had some sections that take place in Hong Kong. So I mailed it to a friend of mine in Hong Kong who had read Raising a Thief. And he said, he said, he said, this is great. You know, it's fast moving. It's interesting and stuff like that. And he said, well, 
if I compare the narrator in Raising a Thief and the narrator in this, I think I like the first narrator more. The guy's super polite. Like that to me was like a raging red flag, like right. disaster, <laughs> disaster. Like this book needs a major rewrite. And it was like, why? Well, it relates to, you know, you got to hear what he's not saying. He's saying that this, you know, the, the narrator isn't that compelling for me. He's not somebody who I'd want to, you know, have a beer with. There are all these things behind what he said. So it's crazy arrogant to say I'm 53. At 53, I'm going to learn how to write this thing. That's arrogant. And then you got to mix it with this other this other thing, I would say. And, you know, realize that most people can't find exactly the right words to describe why something sucks. But it's there. All right, Tyler. Uh, hey, Paul. Good to have you back hey. uh, for a bit. Um, I wondered uh, if you have sort of two different voices that you write in, or maybe more than two. You, you've worked in finance and then Bridgewater for a long time where you sort of write dry, analytical, linear style. Um, obviously, I think uh, I know enough about you to know you're passionate about writers that aren't that. And so do you, have you tried to hone that other style, the artistic style, the, the sort of creative, nonlinear, you know, Proust or some other thing? And how, how do you go about that? Do you just sit down, depending on what you want to write and occupy a different voice? Yeah, I think you try to it, it's it's you try to evolve to something that is very distinct, and it's 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 very hard to do. Um, one of the things that um, I've done recently is, and I think it's a journey for everybody. So when I'm writing first drafts, I can't really listen to music. When I'm editing, I can listen to music, and so it takes a long time to edit. So recently, I went through like the Rolling Stones albums from beginning to like end, like album by album by album by album. Okay, in my opinion, their first three albums suck. That's how long it took for them to begin to develop a voice of like, you're like, that tune, I put it on it. You know, all of a sudden they began expressing things that we we're all feeling we couldn't say. So I think it's an evolution and that's a little bit the pro and con of leaving Bridgewater. You know, the, the con is, is missing all those things I said. The pro is it actually gives you time to do that. And it's an incremental, for me, it's a very incremental process to get there. Even honestly, for those of you who are married, I remember the first time I said, um, introduced somebody, I said, this is my wife. And I was like, for fuck's sake, what are you saying? This is your wife? Like you've been married for 15 minutes and you're like, Mr. I've got a wife. But then over time you get used to it and you're like, this is my wife. <laughs> I was on a surfboard in Hawaii and this guy comes up to me, you know, pretty tough looking guy. And he's like, what do you do? And I go, uh, I'm a writer. And he's like, cool. And I was like, okay. So it's a little bit like you've got to get into the role. Yeah. And it's a little bit pretend initially. And you know what? I think the rolling, I'm not saying I'm the Rolling Stones or any of those other people, but I'm, you know, I'm trying. And the first three albums of the Rolling Stones sucked. And it could be that my first three books suck. And do you go back when you want to write a dry finance article about the balance of payments? Can you go back to the I could, but I found that it wasn't healthy for me. And that's why I stopped doing so many of those op-eds because that's what they wanted. They wanted yeah. a very clinical type of thing. And I was like, listen, I feel like there's a gazillion people that are going to do this. I don't feel like I need to do that. I need to learn to do this, uh, this other type of thing. And so with the Substack, I can see it's more real-time feedback about how people are responding to that. Thank you. Um, Paul, thanks for sticking around with us. Um, if you have time for one more question, I'd love to turn to Michael Terry. Paul, Paul, uh, there are too many things I'd like to say that I'll say to you separately and set in front of a group, but I, I always love talking to you. Um, you are in the equivalent of a triathlon. You are exerting effort and effort and effort, and the payoff seems so distant. How do you stay energized every day to get up and enact that discipline that you described? Um, I, I, the, the, the answer is, is I try to follow a practice. Um, and I've experimented a little bit with what the right practice is, but I just try to follow that discipline. And uh, what I find is most days that gives me energy. So, you know, I wake up first thing in the morning and, you know, it's sunrise in a row and I'm at my desk by a certain period of time, et cetera. And then the music is playing and I'm getting into a flow and I'm like happy. And what I find is, is that the days where that is wavering, 
that rhythm is like an anchor that keeps me placed. And so I'm like, listen, this is really tough writing, but this is the period of time I write. I'm writing till noon and then I'm taking lunch. And so I just accept the fact that some days the wind is not going to be blowing the sails quite as hard. And I don't hate myself for that. And then I find that those practices, the, you know, the early morning wake up, the journaling that I have some time to sit there and read, that those are like islands of safety when you're going through that fog that you're, that you're comfortable with. And a little bit, you know, I also, this sounds very, very kooky, but I felt that um, a little bit when you're on this path, I mean, listen, we could look at this five years from now and being like, listen, he ran out of all his money and he produced total garbage. That's a possible outcome. I, I realize that. But I felt like as I've gone down this path, I've sort of put these things out there and I get pings back from the universe. And it's sort of like these pings, like you're going in the right direction. You're sort of headed towards the right thing. And there, um, you know, some days you go without some, but then randomly you get something back. Like somebody says that, you know, that article I really loved, or you get some review of the book, or somebody says, I've heard you're doing this, let's talk. And, you know, so I, I sort of feel like if you listen for it, it's there. Paul, thank you so much for this. Um... I know for so many of us on this call, our Bridgewater experience would not have been our Bridgewater experience wasn't for you. That is certainly true for me. And this um, was a wonderful taste to um, catch up, both catch up and hear what you're thinking and also explore this new phase of your work. And um, we will be, I personally, and we will be lifelong, you know, supporters of, of what you're doing, after, not just after everything you gave to us, but it's also really nice to be like, yeah, I know that guy. He's I know what he's doing. And um yeah. well and it's there's great ways to be to, part of it. Yeah, I would like to keep you guys part of my lives. And even though we're doing different things. So if there's ways to do that, you know, whatever, we can we can figure that out. So thank you. Thanks again. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.